Hello and welcome to Technically Speaking, a podcast where scientists and engineers come together to chat about a common interest, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Laura and in this episode I'm joined by Ellie and Antonia to talk about invasive species and, on the flip side, how we've unintentionally eradicated some species from the UK. So we're effectively talking about ecology here and start off with Ellie, what do you know about ecology and species management? So I studied zoology for my undergraduate degree and I think people don't realise how many invasive species they probably come into contact with without even knowing it. So there's lots of examples that we're going to explain through the episode. To start off, probably the definition of invasive species I should probably mention. We are specifically talking here about non-native invasive species that have been brought into an area they weren't previously in, usually for some pretty silly reasons, which we'll get into, and they are causing direct harm to that area, to the ecology of that environment, or also economic harm is another impact that they can have. So we will explain more later. Yeah, I think we should definitely come back to that. Antonia, I know you've got a very different background to Ellie. So what is your interest in uh, ecology or invasive species? I definitely don't really know much about biology beyond a GCSE, but you kind of pick up bits or you're supposed to when you're looking at sustainability because you're considering um, what happens to the environment and what is considered natural or not anthropogenic, you know, human man-made effects on the world. So, you know, I can kind of, see some links to this topic but then personally I've also tried to um, figure out what's Japanese not weed and why shouldn't I put it in the green bin because I just remember finding something growing out of the ground in a a couple of places ago that I was renting and it specifically said do not dispose of Japanese not weed or you could get fined I was looking at this plant that had grown out of the ground between some paving stones and I thought, geez, this kind of looks like Japanese knotweed in this picture. I don't, what am I supposed to do with this? Do I burn it? You know, this topic came up and I thought, yeah, I would really want to know more about this. You're an engineer, so I, that's where your sort of sustainability interest comes from because you do that in your day job. I read some definitions of an invasive species that was just anything that's non-native, but Ellie, you said that's not quite correct, that it has to also be doing harm. Yeah, I think probably my definition would be that it would be a species that wasn't originally in the area that has been found, so it's been brought in from elsewhere, and yet is causing a problem, is doing harm to other species, is doing harm to the ecology of the area or potentially is doing harm to someone's bank balance, or potentially all three. I mean, some of these species are real, real problems in the areas that they've been brought into. I guess someone has decided that Japanese nutweed is a plant that is quite harmful in some way. I've had people point out to me that that's Japanese nutweed growing all along that hedgerow, but I don't really understand why that's important. I don't know if Japanese nutweed just maybe isn't a very good example and there are some more tangible examples from the animal world that we can talk about that are a bit more historic, so there's more information out there about them. Have you got any examples, Ellie? Yeah, I've got loads, in fact. People seem to love doing this, especially... If you want to blame anyone for invasive species, blame the Victorians because they really <laughs> they really went ham on it. But I think probably they didn't realise, they didn't have as much information as we do now about the ecology and the effect that they were going to cause. So one of the classics is rabbits in Australia. Basically, people liked hunting a lot in the Victorian area. That was a happy pastime for them. <laughs> Basically, they got introduced into Australia in the late 19th century. It was one guy, Thomas Austin. He was very wealthy. He lived in Australia and he introduced them so that he could hunt them. And he only got 13 wild European rabbits sent to him. And he thought, this will be fine. I've got these. They can live in my back garden. I can shoot them. I'll have a lovely time. 50 years later, they had spread across the entire island of Australia, the entire country. Wow. Australia is a pretty big place. Yeah, exactly. Like that is a lot of rabbits. And some hostile places as well. I love the idea of these little delicate rabbits. Oh, they're just prey. We'll just shoot them. They'll never make it that far. And they've gone all the way. Oh, no, silly human. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going thinking? to do now? <laughs> 
I think the thing with these invasive species is that they have quite a lot in common. Like often they breed very fast. So then they can spread very fast because they're just sheer quantities that they're able to produce in a year. Like I suppose a rabbit maybe could have three or four litters in a year of like easily five or six kits, rabbit kits. So then suddenly if you just extrapolate that out and they don't have to be very old to breed. So then more and more and more. And you think, oh, Australia has at least got, you know, snakes, it's got dingoes, it's got stuff that you'd think would eat the rabbits, and maybe they do. But the problem with these things is that they are not native. So, I mean, a dingo potentially would take a rabbit, but they haven't evolved to take a rabbit. They haven't had that millennia of developing these hunting strategies to take these animals. So, yeah. Thomas brought in these 13 rabbits and all hell broke loose. The numbers got so large that they started destroying all the crops and land and agriculture by just eating everything that was in their way. And they'd start then leading to soil erosion because they've eaten so much of the vegetation wow. that the soil has gone rapidly downhill. There aren't any roots to stabilise the soil, so it just gets washed away in rain or blown away I guess and also they dig like they're making burrows if you're a farmer in 19th century Australia you're gonna have a real problem yeah I've got a vision now of all these farmers going what are we gonna do about this but also all these dingoes just like huddled together drawing plans of like well this rabbit that's here did this <laughs> how can we catch it how can we make this into prey but also I mean I don't know about the dingo population are the dingoes all across Australia are they only in like certain areas like I don't know necessarily the ecology to know that there would have been enough dingoes and then the dingo population would boom and then now you're overrun with dingoes and rabbits. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> so it's just compounded the problem. So I guess someone had to try and think of a solution. I've heard of myxomatosis in rabbits in the UK. Is that something that was tried? So myxomatosis is a virus that allegedly was deliberately released into the UK, but I've, I read when I was looking into this episode, that's not actually true. So as far as historians are aware. <laughs> I'm not sure about the UK, but in Australia, this was like one of the first ever viruses to be introduced to eradicate an animal. So they decided we're going to make a like sort of a rabbit only virus and then this will wipe out the rabbits and we'll, you know, finally get our land back sort of thing. However, although it did kill certainly some like large portion of the population, eventually the rabbits developed an immunity and it became ineffective. I kind of want to say go rabbits, but <laughs> also they shouldn't be there to begin with. You kind of find yourself rooting for them. You're like, and it wasn't your fault that you got brought over. You were living a nice life in Europe and suddenly, you know, you're becoming a rabbit down under and people are trying to kill you. I've seen rabbits wandering around here. I think I'm pretty sure I've seen one with myxomatosis and it didn't look like a good thing. Like, you know, they have sores. They Apparently they got blind and they're all like staggering around like they don't know where they are. Yeah. The only thing you can do is put them out of their misery. So was this virus supposed to kill them or was it supposed to just stop them breeding? Because I've heard of a couple of different techniques to actually reduce populations that you don't want, apart from hunting, of course, you know, we know how effective that could be. You know, I've heard of other ways of like reducing their fertility. Myxomatosis. So that was just supposed to flat out kill the rabbits. Yes. And instead it made them suffer horribly. I mean, it did kill some of them. But I think the point was that the rabbits then developed immunity, so it wasn't like a long-term solution, really, to managing the population, unfortunately, for the Australians. No, and it sounds like it's still a problem, along with other things that people have introduced with the best intentions. Yes, so there's another great example, again, in Australia. I think a lot of these invasive species quite often come to islands. Islands are very interlinked in terms of their ecology and the species that develop there. And when you add a new animal to an island that's been separated from the mainland for so many years, you can really, really mess things up. So again, sort of farming, sort of agriculture. Australia got wind of the fact that in Puerto Rico, they had imported these giant toads from South America onto their sugar canes to eat the bugs that were like devouring all the sugar cane crops. And in the 1930s, this like was like a big sensation. And they were sending these cane toads all around the world. 
And so 1935, I think it was, 100 toads arrived in Queensland, in Australia. They were bred, actively bred to hunt and kill these beetles that were eating all the cane, sugar cane that was in Australia's north coast. And then they went crazy. And to be fair, like if you've not seen a cane toad, they are huge. This is not your regular garden frog. This is a great big sort of football sized get toad. Like they're pretty hefty. What are you meant to do? do they, <laughs> how powerful are they? How far can they jump is the first thing I thought when I saw one. <laughs> I have no idea, but now I'm slightly afraid that they can go really far. Do they have a big tongue that comes out? That's what I imagine frogs do from cartoons. Yes. How do they catch their prey? Um, Not like a chameleon, like not like a huge, great big tongue, but they get to just, you know, hop up to something and and bite it off off a plant. Big mouth just encloses. Yeah, pretty much. It sounds like a nice idea using something from the natural world to eradicate a pest. You'd say that sounds like a better thing to do than, you know, using um, chemical ways of destroying a population or reducing a population. But it sounds like it didn't work out so well. Not really. I think the main problem was that the cane toads, yes, they did potentially eat the bugs. But because they're so big, they also ate a heck of a lot else. So (laughs) they were, you know, introduced just because there's one bug that you want them to eat doesn't mean that they're not going to eat everything else along the way. So, yes, that was a big problem. And also, they are poisonous themselves, so nothing is then eating them. Ah. Oh, no. They just spread with no natural predators. Basically, yeah, they've come to a sort of all-you-can-eat buffet, if you like, of all these species that they can, like, they'll eat rats, they'll eat small quolls, they're called, in Australia. So, yeah, they're supposed to eat these beetles and... While they probably ate some, they also ate absolutely everything else. Wow. And that, again, is that still a problem that hasn't really been solved? It's just kind of, we have to live with it now. To be honest, I think they must have come up with something. And I'm just trying to think what it would have been. But I do know for sure that there are still cane toads going around Australia even now, eating birds' eggs, other frogs. Yeah, taking a toll on the native species of Australia that was there before they arrived. Wow. Humans and Australia don't go well (laughs) together, it sounds like. I can just imagine, like, you know, like a parliamentary meeting, like, what are we going to do about this new problem that we've got in Australia? And someone's like, let's get an animal in. And everyone's like, no, not again. Something that's not animals. Please just just don't, just just leave things as they are. So apparently there was some sort of, like, multi-million dollar campaign to, like, eradicate the toads. It like, hasn't really worked. I think like they're, once you've got them, I think they're pretty hard to get rid of and they're just spread. It's probably like the same thing as the rabbits. They're probably super adaptable. They eat everything. Nothing's really eating them. They can just breed and their numbers will be huge in not actually really that much time. This sounds similar. So if you bring it back to come back home and stop talking about Australia for a while... <laughs> And so many examples. Yeah, but I guess in in the UK, a good one is probably squirrels. Yes. You know, I used to live in Manchester and you'd see them in the parks all the time. And I've seen them in London as well. Some of them come up to you and will feed out of your hand. But where I live now, we have red squirrels. My neighbours say they've seen them in their gardens. I personally haven't seen any in mine, but they're definitely around. I love red squirrels. When I did my master's, I spent quite a lot of time up in the Yorkshire Dales filming them. And they are so tiny and so adorable and so charismatic that you just can't help but adore them. And yet someone, probably, again, a wealthy Victorian, was like, oh, I like hunting. I'm going to introduce grey squirrels so, I, you know, there'll be even more I can hunt them and ruin the population of red squirrels in the UK. Yeah, yet another one of these examples where people don't realise the impact of introducing a species that has not evolved to like live alongside other species and like be in the ecology of the area. I think what everyone is doing is just underestimating. They just think, oh, but I'm only bringing a handful to my garden. It's a little different when it's animals compared to when you're just bringing over, I don't know, an item of clothing. Your item of clothing doesn't run off and get lost in the woods. <laughs> There's a map that you can see of like where the red squirrel population used to be before the introduction of grey squirrels. And it's like just like the tiniest sliver of Cumbria, which has them. Yeah, I think now there's sort of like maybe four, five, six like separate populations of red squirrels. 
because they're only now living in the areas where the grey squirrels aren't living. So if they're together, the grey squirrels will just outcompete them. They'll eat the food source. They are bigger. They're less likely to get eaten by pine martins and things like that. And also they have a virus as well. So the grey squirrels brought a virus across, squirrel pox, which again, they're carriers for it, the greys, but the reds are really affected by it. So again, that's just wiped out a load of the red population. So if you think bringing an animal across to a new place is a good idea, think again. And a lot of it seems to be either the direct damage they do, either by disrupting an ecosystem or because they carry something else that's a problem like those viruses. One thing I'd read with pine martens specifically was that because red squirrels are grown up with pine martens for millennia, they know how to spot when there's a pine martin around. They can There's a scent, so they know to stay away, whereas the grey squirrels haven't adapted to that and they just carry on as normal so the pine martin gets them pine martin's like it looks a bit like a cat but i think it's like weasel family and i've definitely seen stoats and weasels around here in the fields and on the fells so maybe that explains why we still have red squirrels around here yeah it's all interlinked you wouldn't look at a gray squirrel if you had no idea and think that shouldn't be here like it's adapted to living in the trees it's all fine in that way but at the same time if we'd never got gray squirrels Think we wouldn't think anything of it by having red squirrels run around the park and come up to you and eat from your hand. And if you go to France, they have no grey squirrels. They never made it across the channel. So it's very interesting to see, like, compare that ecology and think if grey squirrels made it to France, what a terrible impact they would probably then have on the red squirrel population. Oh, yeah, and they just keep spreading across Europe. Yeah, once they got to the mainland, oh, my God. Yeah. Or would there be enough, you know, other pine martin cousins to stop them? I suppose it depends how many and where and how quickly they bred and all of that sort of thing that we've seen in the other examples, like how adaptable that they can be to these new places and whether they can establish a population. So what you're saying is we shouldn't run this as an experiment. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe only a virtual one, a simulation. Going back to the example of rabbits, I was reading a paper about like the history of the British Isles or something, like 20th century Britain or something like that. So it wasn't a science paper, it was history. It was talking about when rabbits were first considered pests. And I think it was because attitudes changed, but also because I think we destroyed other populations like wolves. We totally eradicated wolves that didn't leave a lot of things that would um, see the rabbits as prey. So then the rabbit population just boomed. So this is also the problem with the UK is that we are so nature depleted compared to what we once had. And if you think of these animals that we would have had, so we would have had bears, we would have had wolves, we would have lynx, and all of those would have been eating rabbits for a long time. But of course, we then, you know, hunted wolves to extinction, hunted lynx to extinction. And with no natural predators, of course, the rabbit population is going to boom and they're going to eat, you know, more agriculture after those times, eating more crops, upsetting more people, causing, you know, big holes in people's lawns and then be seen as a pest because there's just so many more than that would have been had we not killed all the lynx. (laughs) But then, I, so if you think about wolves, do you really want to encounter a wolf, a wolf when you're out for your Sunday morning walk? Or would you rather see? How cool would that be if you went out for a walk and you saw a wolf? I'd be absolutely buzzing. I'd like to think that there are things you can do to make yourself more scary. So the wolf doesn't really want to have a go at you. Maybe the wolves just kind of get used to people and just live among us or alongside us. Well, I always see videos of like people walking in like national parks in America and they like see a bear. And I'm like, I'd love that. I would absolutely love to go walking and just see a bear what would you do this is my concern it was just like i wouldn't even know what to do you hear about we have like two snake species that are like <laughs> dangerous to us and i'm like i don't even know what to do if i saw one of those like is that one what, that you get someone to pee on you no that's a jellyfish <laughs> and, uh, and you know you, do not wee on a snake i feel like we're so out of touch with nature that seeing a jellyfish on the beach you're more likely to see a plastic bag floating in the sea than a jellyfish and probably for the better that we don't get stung <laughs> i have definitely done that mistake in the plastic bag for a jellyfish and been a little bit I don't know what that is and what it's going to do to me. Oh, that's such a shame to me because I think if I see a jellyfish on the beach, I'm like, this is so cool. Like, obviously don't touch it is always the first rule. Ah. You don't know what it is, don't touch it. But they should be in the sea. We shouldn't have plastic bags floating in the oceans. We should have all the jellyfish and we should have 
these species like they were there first they are what makes the ecology and the richness of the species come back and that's what we need to get back we need to rewild it's true i have a question for you guys though like how do you know that there aren't like red squirrels that have become really stealthy just like living in your root space right now and you don't know how how do we know what the populations are i mean i'm fairly sure they're not living in the root if they are i'll be ecstatic they wouldn't be considered invasive then they wouldn't be a pest for you they'd they'd be a welcome guest they would be a welcome guest and they're not invasive they are native they should be here if it's gray squirrels living in the room they can move right out because they should not (laughs) not be colonizing my house but i mean there are scientific studies people are monitoring populations especially red squirrels because they are now so i guess endangered in the uk like they only live in these small places we have to know the population to know how to help conserve them like how much area they're going to need that sort of thing so people are studying these populations and they are looking at ways to to help yeah i have visions of people camping out in random locations people just have this job just going out and sitting there for a day and just counting what animals go past and that's it that's all they do yeah people do do that you could do surveys like butterfly surveys and all sorts where you literally will walk like say you're in a woods you can transect the woods into different squares you can walk like a a transect of that line and every hour every half an hour you stop and you do species count and you count everything that you see in that one place and say you see I don't know 20 peacock butterflies and 10 red admirals and that data is so valuable and that's why people like the RSPB do the big garden bird watch that you might have heard of like this sort of citizen science and people counting because you can't be everywhere you can't do studies across the UK that would be a huge amount of resources huge amount of money but you can get people that are avid bird watchers or even just you know mildly interested and know what a robin looks like to send you their data and think what a resource that is and think how many more birds and more animals you can count that way yeah and i love the idea that anyone can get involved with this and i guess as an individual you learn more about your local area and you learn a little bit more about different species like how to identify plants or animals and i guess you also get to learn a little bit about the science as well absolutely i mean i don't really know anything about jellyfish but if i was on a beach and someone was doing a survey or if there was a big jellyfish watch then it takes the fear away because you know what you're looking at and you think, oh, it's a jellyfish, it can't hurt me, it's not one of the dangerous ones, or this shouldn't be here, it's because of you know climate change and the ocean's warming up that it's been swept across, or there was a big storm and this population is blown away. And as soon as you learn why, you suddenly think, this isn't scary, this is fascinating as to why these animals are here and what they're doing. I'm a physical scientist. Most of the science I've done has either been on a computer or in a lab in very, very controlled conditions where I don't get random <laughs> species popping up. That I'm going to come expect. into your lab and Maybe just, sometimes I do. you know, throw a little grey squirrel in <laughs> and see what happens. <laughs> we did occasionally get lizards or oyster catchers or something outside the lab that were a bit unusual. <laughs> I don't think they ever made it into the building. But they didn't become part of your study the day, I hope. They didn't suddenly become bombarded with atoms or a, <laughs> or accelerated through a particle accelerator. No animals were harmed in the making of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've irradiated plants and um, cow dung. <laughs> I really want to ask why. <laughs> we wanted to see if we could make better feedstock for an anaerobic digester by breaking things down with radiation first. And we were radiating grass and then adding cow dung to it. I got that slightly wrong. So the cow dung has bacteria in that break the grass down. So the grass had already been broken down a little bit by the radiation. Amazing. See, my, my thought was going to be it was to to analyse the effect on the local area. But no, it's... Uh, it's the other way round. <laughs> and did it work? That's my next question. The experiment was inconclusive, so we need to set it up differently. And then we ran out of time and funding. So it may have. Oh. So for me, everything is all about controlling what you've got around you. So if I'm a scientist that has an invasive species in the lab, I would have to find some way to get it out of there. And if the experiment has gone completely wrong, I'm just going to have to start again. Or if it's gone really, really wrong, I guess just run away. 
lock the door. It depends it. what's. I mean, if I throw a squirrel in, you can probably shepherd it out of a window. But if something bigger comes in, you might have a more tricky time. I don't know. Herding squirrels, herding one squirrel, doesn't sound all that easy. Um, I struggle to herd the dog sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. So aside from herding animals that we've domesticated, how do we sort of stop introducing animals and species that shouldn't be there? How do we stop invasive species happening? One of the good things now is that we've had some of these examples, like we've seen what's happened to the Victorians and we have so much more data now and so much more research to say that introducing a species to an area that it's not from is usually a bad idea. And I think now the tide is turning and actually people want to introduce, reintroduce species that were in the native area but have been lost. So there's this big push at the moment for things like rewilding and bringing back species that were once found in the UK or further afield to countries where they've been, you know, hunted to extinction or wiped out by disease or any of that to sort of rebuild that ecology. So one of the famous examples in the UK is beavers. There's been a big push in recent years, sort of the last probably not necessarily even 20 years, to bring beavers back because beavers are what we call like an umbrella species, like a keystone species. And the benefit of bringing beavers back is that they change the landscape. They, you know, gnaw the trees, they dam rivers, and they change it and flood areas, which then creates a whole new habitat for lots of invertebrates, lots of birds, lots of plant species. And this process is so natural, but it's what's been lost by getting rid of the beavers in the first place. So now we're bringing the beavers back and they're changing the landscape around them, which is in turn bringing all these native species back and all these different insects back into that area. And this is something that, again, is it could be happening near me because there's a wild Ennerdale project, Ennerdale Valley in the Lake District, which is quite an isolated little valley. There is was a reservoir there that we used to abstract water from until fairly recently. I keep mentioning this. I feel like I should know more about it. So the idea is that that will be turned back from the reservoir it is now into something more natural and more species will also be introduced and one of them is beavers and they're currently consulting with locals to find out if people support it or if they can see any negatives of this. Uh, so one of the negatives I'd read from reintroduction in Devon I think it was was although there were villages downstream that were now less susceptible to flooding because of the way the beavers that engineered the environment farms that were upstream were more likely to flood with the knock-on effect that people that run that farm lose out they're negatively economically affected so back to what you were saying before Ellie about finance being a thing we've changed a lot as well like when beavers originally lived here there was so much less think of motorways think of infrastructure and agriculture in the way that we do it today like farming is so much more you know compared to like Victorian villages it's on a huge scale across the country and yes there will be potentially negative impacts but the idea is that by bringing in the beavers you're protecting those little villages and wider communities like think of flooding damage in recent years it's been horrendous so many of these problems are caused by climate change and storms and all of this. And if we can have a natural resource that can mitigate some of these problems, think how much more money that would save compared to the effect of a few fields being underwater or potentially even you can pay people to offset the like loss of crops that the beavers would cause. I mean, I don't know how that would work, but there are options that could be managed in terms of like reaping the benefit. And we also don't know. I mean, beavers haven't been here in what, so like 400 years, probably even more than that. And mm. we don't necessarily know if they change the course of a river or if they flood certain areas. It's a bit like introducing any species. You don't necessarily always know what the impact will be, but we can guess because they were here before and they are other in other areas what what's likely to happen. So it's an interesting idea and I really I really like it because you can see the impact and like people will do like five year studies of what happens when you introduce beavers to an area and the water conservation is such a big part of that. 
I can imagine that at least to start with, if it's a small population, you can probably track them quite easily. And there's probably a plan to figure out how to do that and also to spot signs of what the beavers have been up to. I mean, I imagine that dams aren't that difficult to spot. And I quite like the idea of going for a walk in Endale Valley every day to see what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. We're not, yeah, we're not introducing, you know, 600 beavers back into the UK. All of a sudden, it's like very small, two or three in a certain area often fenced I think they have to be fenced in certain parts now just so that we can monitor them for the for the scientific research so yeah it's really interesting yeah so I'd be interested to see what happens I suspect that the project at Ennerdale will get the goal ahead I can't imagine there'd be much resistance to it because there's not a lot of farming in that valley either and the village or the town downstream has definitely been affected by flooding and it would be nice to see even more biodiversity in that valley as well, I think, especially for an area that's so close to me that I can see things changing. But we need to revisit this. Technically speaking, in five years, we'll come up to Laura's and see the effect of the beavers on Ennerdale. <laughs> Definitely. And something else I'd read from that, I want to say it was a pilot study, but that's probably the wrong word, but I'm going to go with it anyway. That study in Devon was that when you mentioned water conservation, Ellie, they actually helped clean the water as well because um, the dams would help remove pollutants like soil and um, fertilizers, I think, things like that, or any particulate in the water. So the water that was thrown through that village, not only was it less likely to flood it, but it was cleaner. You see, the power of the beaver, it's amazing. <laughs> and you think like that's maybe two, uh-huh. three animals at the most doing that and causing that wider knock-on effect. Like what if we'd never got rid of them in the first place? I think how much better the UK water courses would be. I mean, I know there's lots of other factors, but... All hail the beaver, I say. Bring back the beaver. <laughs> yeah, and they were they were eradicated because of, um, it was hunting. It was for meat and fur, wasn't it? But they were also seen as a bit of a pest, like flooding local farms. And I feel like now, hundreds of years later, we know more about farming as well and more about how to manage the land and engineer the environment, that we could find a solution to that. Part of it is probably because we all started saying, this land is my land. And then, you know, you want to sort of manage your little section, whereas if it was all a bit more of a big open space, then you kind of see it as all balancing out, you know, you balance out the next field. Yeah, you want to work with your neighbours rather than against them, whether that's a person or a beaver. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Bringing that sort of like life cycle thinking, <laughs> thinking about the whole cycle of the water as well. Beavers used to play a part of it and we've just kind of taken them out of the equation. Exactly. Like beavers create wetlands, like that's part of the reason they're coming back to be like part of the flood defence and to manage like flooding in areas. So yeah, they are really, really fascinating I wonder if they could help with any invasive species. Because beavers are environmental engineers, you said they're a keystone species, they can have such a big effect on their environment. Maybe they can undo some of the other damage that we've done. Or flood the fields and stop rabbits breeding. No. <laughs> Get rid of all that knotweed somehow. <laughs> I wonder that. Would beavers eat knotweed? I mean, probably not. It's probably not woody enough, but maybe. They might not know what it is because it's not native. Yeah, they probably have to try it first, wouldn't they? To be like, this is horrible. Why is this here in my landscape? <laughs> so these beavers that are going to eventually colonise the valley near me are just going to be walking around and going, what's that? <laughs> what's that? What's that? I'll try this. Do you know what this is? <laughs> <laughs> like stopping random tourists and saying, excuse me, can you help me? <laughs> it didn't look like this 400 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> can you just get out your smartphone and bring up one of those apps that identifies plants and tell me what that is please <laughs> bringing citizen science to help beavers oh i mean if you're going to teach a beaver to use an app i'm 100 percent there for it <laughs> oh this reminds me of does, does anyone remember the is it the 1980s bbc version of the lion the witch and the wardrobe the tv series no that had beavers in it, Did it? Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? They go to the... It does. Yes. Didn't they have tea or, like, lunch with the beavers or something? They did, yeah. And uh, the, the 1980s version, it's on YouTube, and it's just mind-blowing how much technology, film technology has moved on <laughs> to represent animals. <laughs> it's very obviously two people wandering around in suits, and they're not, like, particularly great suits of these beavers, like, shuffling about. Oh, no. <laughs> That's really interesting because that makes me think, when was that written and were beavers still in the UK 
at the time that the C.S. Lewis would have written The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe? Oh, that's a very, hmm. very good question. I feel like because you said 400 years ago and I don't think C.S. Lewis was around all that long ago. No, it was World War Two, right? Because that was why the, the kids moved out to their whoever relative's house where the wardrobe was, right? You're right, yeah. It was a, a an eccentric professor. Yeah. So beavers are so iconic that they pop up in literature and in films and in BBC productions of, I guess, quite high value at the time, production value, <laughs> but in comparison to what's done now. Man, just watch it. It's interesting. <laughs> I can't wait. I just love the idea of people in movies in suits. Like They're like real people. Like when you watch Doctor Who and they're in <laughs> the Daleks, like a person is in that Dalek. I just think that was so crazy to me. I agree. Or maybe we should do a future episode on um, how technical things and films have changed with a science engineering slant. <laughs> Ooh, I like that idea. Yeah, that would be really interesting, actually. And like, if we remade The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe now, how much better would the beavers look? <laughs> <laughs> if we can do it without CG. Just the beavers. Oh, yeah, forget the witch. Forget Mr. Tumnus. <laughs> yeah, forget about Aslan. <laughs> It's all about the beavers. Like a talking lion, <laughs> gigantic thing, but how good are them beavers? Yeah, I should probably give C.S. Lewis more credit, actually, because lions, <laughs> talking beavers, and Mr. Tumnus, he probably wasn't going off the ecology of the UK at the time. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Unless there was a native species of talking lion that has somehow gone under the radar for all this time. You never know if you've got red squirrels in your attic and you don't know about that. Who knows what lions can do? I feel like we should probably stop talking before this gets even stranger. So I guess to sum up the sensible parts of the conversation, humans have got a history of introducing or eradicating species to an island, it turns out, uh, with unfortunate consequences. So when we introduce an invasive species, we need to decide what to do next. Do we live with it or do we undo it? And the flip side is that we've eradicated some species from the UK, but there are plans to bring some of them back in a controlled way, which ensures that the benefits will outweigh any negative effects. And there are also some ways of monitoring populations that we kind of touched on very briefly, but we can use those methods to ensure that human activities aren't adversely affecting ecosystems. And I think the ideal is a natural world that fits in with human activities and vice versa, which sounds a bit like sustainability from a certain point of view. It is sustainability. Oh, good. Yeah, we have not really defined sustainability fully, and I feel we should do that in a future episode as well. So if you would like to find out more, or ask us to feature something particular in an episode, or if you like the idea of talking about sustainability, or how science and engineering is used in films, I think is what we discussed, you can find us on Twitter, you can leave a comment on the episode, you can follow us on Instagram, or you can find us on Reddit. And Thank you! Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.